I think the Latino identity is pretty confusing to me uh, because uh, oftentimes I find it in a little checkbox on a form and, and I'm confused on whether I should put Latino or Hispanic, but I'm Mexican. As Latin Americans, as Hispanics in the US, um, there's, there's a community get, that gets built regardless of which specific country you're coming from. And our history is a history of African people, indigenous people, Europeans, conquistadores, all these different people colliding, many times not with their consent. So that informs all these loaded issues people have. It's like navigating three identities. You're, if you're from the States, you're American, you're Black, and you're Latina. And furthermore, wherever country that you identify and coming from. And that's, those are, that's a lot to navigate. But at this point in my life, I actually don't identify as Guatemalan. And it's something that I guess a lot of like young immigrants sort of feel where there's this saying like, ni da aquí, ni da allá. Not from there, not from here. In trying to blend in with the culture in America, I gave up a lot of uh, what I grew up with. Maybe I saw it as something that was kind of shameful or in the way. Uh, I wanted to dress like my friends in America. I wanted to talk like them. I wanted to be like them, listen to the same music. I started listening to country music. I got all these crazy questions like, did you come here in a canoe? And do you know what snow is? And do you live in a hut? in Puerto Rico. I thought my name was Spick until I was about 13. And that was my first uh, awareness that uh, race was an issue. People say, oh, you look like a white dude. In some context, not in all context, depends where I am, depends who I'm with, depends a lot, whole lot of things. Um, depends what language I'm speaking. But however I look, when I leave my name, I can't get a phone call back about an apartment in New York City. And this isn't like 10 places I call, this is like 30. And I remember telling a kid one time, I was like, let me tell you, the Ku Klux Klan comes here and they see your last name, you're going too, bro. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and the kids are like, what are you talking about? And it was like a big thing. People generally, you know, unless I speak Spanish, um, you know, people assume right away, I mean, that I'm African American, that I'm black. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, just one of those things. It may be the deep voice, it may be the color of my skin. Because I talk white, I'm not. Dominican, or I'm not black, or I'm not Afro-Latina, or whoever people perceive me as of being. Um, and that hurt, and that still hurts. <laughs> because one of my daughters is lighter than the other, they had blackness issues. And I remember my oldest daughter telling my youngest daughter that she was black and her hair, she says something. And I remember crying like immediately, like, oh my God, no, no, no. And I had to sit them down and talk to them about our roots and that everything that they learned from the family was wrong. I feel like I wanted more, more of my culture. You know, I grew up, there was a point I stopped speaking Spanish to her and I still don't speak to her in Spanish. So I feel like something was lost, and I don't know if it was just because she was busy raising five kids and didn't really think about culture in that way and how I would come to identify myself. Growing up, you know, like this, as you know, as a, as a young young teenager, I told people I was Puerto Rican, which is completely, you know, which is right. But at a particular point, when I became a little more politicized, I was definitely more of a black nationalist. I was a Puerto Rican nationalist, maybe because the concept of black nationalism and the black liberation movement is so much more accessible. There isn't a language issue. So yeah, I, I totally was reading Malcolm and Marcus and James Baldwin and Huey Newton before I read any of the Puerto Rican nationalists. Either you're black or you're white. And, and if you're like kind of in the middle, you kind of like don't want to be in the middle. You want to, a lot of us want to be white but we're still brown, we're still color, you know, we still have color, you know, we're still, according to what race, what the institution is telling us, what race is based on your skin color. So you're like, I'm brown. So that's kind of like where it came. Like, I'm not, I, I, I'm not black. 
and I'm not white and I don't wanna be white. And so I'm, I'm kind of brown and this is kind of like a thing that's there. If, if you are closer to being white, you are supreme. If you are not, you are less than. And to me, that's how I've understood it. And that's why I think it's very important that Latinos who look like me say, you, you identify as Latino, cool. Colombiano, cool, whatever else. But you benefit from light skin privilege. Uh, you, the fact that you have ojos claros, people want to fetishize that, understand what that means. However much I might want to say, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so special because I have green eyes. You, you're, you're perpetuating white, white supremacy by, by running with that. I'll talk to a young girl, a young teenager, and she'll say, you know, I'm not white enough to fit into mainstream society. I'm not black American enough to fit in in that, in, you know, in, in that um, faction of society. And I'm like, but you know what? You're the best person to be kind of like a connector between both because in you is everything. And being Latino in an American kind of new world way is basically being a physical embodiment of how America began as we know it. So you're every woman. So for me, being Latino is being phenomenal.